Tonight at six, a world first as the Pfizer mass coronavirus vaccination programme gets underway in the UK. Margaret Keenan, who's 91 next week, is the first person to get the jab. She calls it the best early birthday present she could have. I would say go for it. Go for it because it's, it's free and it's the best thing that's ever happened. She is one of thousands to be given the first jabs across the UK today with over 80s care home workers and NHS staff first in line. It's amazing to see the vaccine coming out. It's amazing to see this tremendous you know, shot in the arm for the entire nation, but we can't afford to relax now. We'll be answering some of your questions about the vaccine and the path ahead. Also tonight, the Prime Minister will travel to Brussels tomorrow for dinner with the President of the European Commission to try to unlock post-Brexit trade talks. Former England World Cup winner Steve Thompson, who's been diagnosed with early onset dementia, is one of eight former players planning to take legal action against rugby's governing body. And the Queen meets volunteers and key workers at Windsor Castle to thank them for their work during this pandemic. And coming up in sport on BBC News... Uh... Good evening and welcome to the BBC News at six. A day of history today at the end of a very long and difficult year as the UK became the first country in the world to begin using a fully tested vaccine against coronavirus. 90-year-old Margaret Keenan was the first to get the Pfizer jab at University Hospital in Coventry. Thousands of people have been vaccinated today. 800,000 doses of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine have already arrived in the UK and that is enough to vaccinate 400,000 people. The over 80s care home workers and NHS staff will be among the very first to get the jab. More than 80 vaccine centres are being set up. Most for now are in hospitals and people will be called in for the vaccination. Our health editor Hugh Pym was in Coventry as the first vaccine rolled out. A warning his report contains flashing images. An early morning hospital appointment. At first glance, nothing out of the ordinary. But this was unlike anything before. Margaret, aged 90, was the very first patient to receive the newly approved coronavirus vaccine. There was a well-deserved round of applause and intense interest among media and health officials at this hospital vaccination clinic in Coventry. She seemed to take it all in her stride. So, Margaret, first of all, tell us, how was it for you? It, it was fine. It was fine. I wasn't nervous at all. It was really good, yeah. And what do you say to those who might be having second thoughts about having this well, vaccine? I would say go for it. Go for it because it's, it's free and it's the best thing that's ever happened uh, at the moment. So do, please go for it. That's all I say, you know. If I can do it, well, so can you. The matron who administered the historic jab said the significance only sunk in afterwards. I do this all the time. I've done hundreds of vaccinations, but never with such interest and people like wanting to know what's going on and wanting to um, actually witness it. So it's really surreal. It's a world first. It represents extraordinary progress by science. But for the NHS, this is a huge achievement, turning research into reality. Around the UK, there were similar stories. In Glasgow, the vaccine was delivered to the SEC centre, with NHS staff among the first to receive the jabs. Uh, it's really exciting. It's lovely. You feel like you're a wee bit of history in the making, don't you? It's really lovely. In Belfast, health staff queued to get their jabs. The policy is for those doing the vaccinations to be vaccinated first. The health service in general um, has struggled throughout the fight um, for COVID-19, so it feels like an, a momentous day, so very privileged. At this vaccine centre in Cardiff, one of seven in Wales, more than 200 people have been booked in every day till Friday. It's a good day for the whole country. The Prime Minister, on a visit to a London vaccination centre, wanted to rein in people's expectations. So I just urge people to contain their impatience. 
Uh, it's a very, very exciting moment, but there's still a lot of work to be done and a lot of discipline to be maintained. The head of NHS England was urging people not to turn up without appointments. Wait to hear from the NHS. We will make contact with you. The vaccine is being made available to us from the manufacturers on a phased basis. So the bulk of the vaccination is going to be in January, February, March and April. The priority groups now include the over 80s. Harry and Ranjan, who spoke to us yesterday, had their jabs together in Newcastle with badges to prove it. <laughs> Margaret certainly won't forget her vaccination, nor will NHS staff on a dramatic and momentous day, which they can only hope marks a turning point. Hugh Pym, BBC News, Coventry. Well, the second person to be vaccinated in the UK today was a man called William Shakespeare from Warwickshire. He and Margaret Keenan were among thousands to get the jab at dozens of hospitals around the UK. Our correspondent John Kay has been hearing from some of them. A day so many have been waiting for. And at Bristol's Southmead Hospital, first in the queue is Jack. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> I'm 98. I suppose it's a bit of excitement. He's been in hospital for a month having treatment for bone cancer, but he'll be heading home in a few days. So the vaccine that's just arrived should give him protection from COVID. So we're going to give the injection in the uh, top of your arm just here. I thought that's what we came for, dear. That's exactly <laughs> it. I just didn't want any surprises. No surprises that's and good. no hesitation. This veteran of the Second World War, happy to follow floppy. orders. And this arm floppy, all oh. right? No, boxy boot. <laughs> That's why I'm in Navy, <laughs> sir. Jack will still have to follow orders, even when he's had his second jab later this month. But he will finally be able to think about seeing his family again. I live in hope that the middle of next year we hopefully be living a normal life. Oh, lovely. I haven't seen him in so long. Bless him. Jack's granddaughter, Steph, hasn't been able to visit because of his cancer and because of the Covid risk. So she was delighted to see our pictures. She hopes the vaccine will mean he can soon be with the great grandchildren he loves so much. Well, he's such a social character. He loves seeing people. So just to be able to go and see him that bit more and not have the worry will be great. A hope echoed across the country today. In Milton Keynes, husband and wife, Arthur and Barbara, she went first. I'd rather have the vaccine than have the COVID-19. I mean, if you're given a choice, there's, there's no contest. And in the Bards County of Warwickshire, to jab or not to jab? This really is 81-year-old William Shakespeare. It could make a difference to our lives from now on, couldn't it? Uh, the start of changing our lives and our lifestyle. You've made history today. <laughs> Back in Bristol, no sign of any side effects for Jack. Well, thank you all. Thank you. Yeah. Grateful and finally able to plan a future. John Kay, BBC News. <laughs> Well, it is the biggest vaccination programme in the history of the NHS and the beginning of the road back to some sort of normality. The Health Secretary for England, Matt Hancock, says he hopes current restrictions will be lifted by the spring and people will be able to go on summer holidays. Our health correspondent, Catherine Burns, looks at some of the big questions surrounding the COVID jab. The first thing most people want to know is when they'll get the vaccine and generally the answer is no time soon. We've got around 800,000 doses of this Pfizer vaccine to start with. That's enough for 400,000 people. So the plan is to start with the most vulnerable, over 80s, care home staff and some frontline NHS workers. But even people in these groups might not get it until into the new year. One thing to remember is that the regulator is looking at other vaccines and when and if it approves them, it should speed things up. So this is where that first vaccination happened this morning and it's been going on all day. It's one of up to 70 hospital hubs across the country. They're starting with hospitals because they've got the freezers to keep this vaccine at minus 70 degrees. Soon, before Christmas, the hope is to get the vaccines out to care homes and some GP surgeries. And 
then in the new year, there'll be vaccination centres in conference halls and sports stadiums. We saw Maggie Keenan having her first injection this morning and saying she didn't feel a thing. Well, more than 20,000 volunteers have had the Pfizer vaccine during clinical trials and a small number of them did experience some side effects. They were pretty mild, things like a sore arm or maybe feeling a bit headachey or tired for a few days. The immune system does start to kick in sometime after the first injection. But for this particular vaccine, after 21 days, patients need a second booster dose. And then a week after that, they'll reach their full level of immunity. So if someone had it today, that would be on the 5th of January. One really important thing to note though, this vaccine is up to 95% effective, which means it works for most people, but not absolutely everybody. This Pfizer vaccine has been through rigorous safety checks, but there are some things we just can't know yet. For example, how long does it protect us for? Well, we'll just have to wait and see. Another question is, does it stop the virus from spreading? So we know that it stops people from getting sick, but we don't know if it also prevents them from getting infected in the first place and so passing it on to others. All this means that if you are one of the lucky few to have had the vaccine so far, for now, you still need to stick to social distancing. Catherine Burns there. Well, it is a huge day, but this is just the start of a vaccination programme that will last many months. And there is hope that other jabs could also be approved soon. Our medical editor, Fergus Walsh, is with me now. And if we just take a step back, it is extraordinary that less than a year after the first cases of coronavirus were diagnosed here in the UK, this vaccination programme is unfolding. Sophie, it's a great day for science and for humanity, and I think it's the first step in a very long road towards getting out of this pandemic. And to have a highly effective vaccine in less than a year is astonishing. It was by no means certain back in the spring. There are lots of viruses we don't have vaccines for. Over the past 20 years, more than £10 billion has been spent on research trying to find a vaccine against HIV without success. And we don't just have one vaccine, we've got several. We've got the Moderna vaccine that looks effective, and then we've got the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine that the UK has ordered 100 million doses of. Now, today, that team were the first to publish their trial results data in a peer-reviewed medical journal. Really important for transparency. And if, as we hope, that vaccine is approved before the end of the year, that will really speed up the rollout in spring 2021 because it doesn't need to be kept at ultra-low temperatures just in a fridge. And that will really help getting this pandemic and, and seeing the end of it at some point next year. Fergus Walsh, thank you. Well, the latest government figures show there were 12,282 new coronavirus infections recorded in the latest 24-hour period. The average number of new cases reported per day in the last week is now 15,308. 1,359 people have been admitted to hospital on average each day over the week to last Thursday. 616 deaths were reported. That's people who died within 28 days of a positive COVID-19 test. That's almost 100 more than this time last week. It means on average in the past week, 428 deaths were announced every day and it takes the total number of deaths so far across the UK to 62,033. The Prime Minister will travel to Brussels tomorrow to have dinner with the President of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, to try to unlock a post-Brexit trade deal. Negotiations remain stuck with only weeks to go before the transition period ends at the end of December. The politicians hope that meeting in person will find a solution. Our Deputy Political Editor Vicky Young reports. Will there be a deal, Prime Minister? Trade talks have run into trouble and Boris Johnson will soon need to take some difficult decisions. Everyone's waiting to see if there's a way through. I think that the situation at the moment is very tricky. Our friends have, have just got to understand that uh, the UK has left the European Union in order uh, to be able to exercise democratic control over, over the way we do things. And uh, then there's also the issue of, of fisheries where we're a long way apart still. But, you know, hope springs eternal. There has been progress in another very tricky area. To avoid checks along the Irish border, Northern Ireland will continue to follow some EU rules. 
but that means inspections on certain goods entering Northern Ireland from the rest of the UK. Businesses there have been worried about extra paperwork and the impact on food and medicine supplies. How do you start to unpeel the complexity that is Northern Ireland and not create any instability? And so I think if they've got some sort of solution today, albeit it's late, we will definitely welcome it and we'll be so pleased. And we really hope that with the detail that comes out, that they've really listened to some of our concerns. This has been a hugely complicated and controversial issue where economic considerations have had to be seen in the context of a delicate peace process. Positives have been difficult to find in recent days uh, when it comes to Brexit negotiations, but this is most certainly uh, a very important positive for the island of Ireland as a whole. Uh, because what this does now is it provides the guarantees that Ireland's place in the single market and the issues around the border are now all settled. Hopefully, this is a signal that the British government is in deal-making mood. Some see today's agreement as a positive sign for the broader trade talks. But don't forget, those arrangements in Northern Ireland will apply whether there's a deal or not. And EU sources say that their chief negotiator, Michel Barnier, has told European ministers that we're now tilting towards no deal. And while politicians talk, the uncertainty affects businesses everywhere. The manager of this sawmill in Somerset says he's ready to adapt. We have to be as positive as we possibly can about it and move forward. We employ uh, three, four people and a couple of part-timers and, and for us, Having to let people go is the worst, the worst thing for me. So my biggest fear is, is, is having to let staff members go if there's any obvious price increases and, and we become less efficient and, and if we go into recession. Tomorrow, Boris Johnson heads to Brussels for a dinner with the president of the European Commission, a last chance to find a breakthrough and a trade deal that both sides can sign up to. Vicky Young, BBC News, Westminster. Our island correspondent Emma Vardy is in Belfast for us now. And there has been some progress on uh, how to implement Northern Ireland aspects of, of Brexit. The reaction there? Well, there's been a cautious welcome from businesses here because after so much uncertainty, an agreement and some decisions means they now have something they are able to plan for. But really, the devil is going to be in the detail that is going to be revealed tomorrow. So as we were just hearing, remember, from January, Northern Ireland enters these special arrangements where it remains closer to the EU than the rest of the UK. And no matter what happens, it means ports here in Northern Ireland are gearing up for new paperwork and new checks that they never had to deal with before. Now, previously, Boris Johnson once famously said to people who are worried about the Irish sea border, don't worry, guys, by the time we're through with all this, you'll be able to chuck some of that paperwork in the bin. Now, tomorrow we'll find out if that's really the case and just how much the burden of extra red tape on traders has been reduced and why that is important, of course, because, because it has a knock-on effect for the prices of the goods that people here uh, pay for on the shelves. Emma Vardy, thank you. The time is coming up to 20 past six, our top story this evening. A world first as 90-year-old Margaret Keenan is the first person to receive the Pfizer COVID vaccine as the biggest vaccination program in NHS history begins. And with the MOBO Awards taking place tomorrow, we hear from nominees about the challenges they have faced during the pandemic. And coming up on Sports Day on BBC News, Motor Racing's female-only championship, the W Series, will be part of next year's Formula One British Grand Prix weekend at Silverstone. A group of former professional rugby players are planning legal action against the sport's governing bodies, claiming that rugby has left them with permanent brain damage. 42-year-old Steve Thompson can't even remember being part of England's 2003 World Cup triumph. He is one of eight former players, all diagnosed with early-onset dementia, who are taking part in the legal action. If successful, it could change the way the game is played. The sport's world governing body says it takes player safety very seriously and uses the latest research in injury prevention. Our correspondent Chris McLaughlin has more. Australia 2003 and English rugby's greatest triumph. I can't remember any of the games whatsoever, anything that happens in those games. Former hooker Steve Thompson is 42. This month, he was diagnosed with early-onset dementia. He blames repeated blows to the head. 
you know, you're in scrummage sessions on the, on the scrum machine and you're passing out, you're coming up, like you're out, people are training, you get back up and you've got these bright white lights around your eyes and you're not, you're not with it and suddenly, and you'll be doing that time after time. You know, they were just making us just use our head constantly. 11 former professionals have recently been tested. All have early onset dementia. For now, eight are preparing legal action. And so it's expected that next week a pre-legal letter will be delivered to the RFU, the WRU and World Rugby. It's a letter that has the potential to change the very fabric of the game. What it will say is that they are responsible for the permanent brain damage of players due to negligence. It's widely accepted the game has become more physical in recent years and rugby has tightened its concussion protocols. But is it enough? Right, there's two colours now. Alex Popham is 41. He played over 350 games of professional rugby, including 33 times for Wales. In April, he was diagnosed with early onset dementia and could be in a care home by the time he's 50. As a 40-year-old to hear that, it was upsetting for me, but even more so for, for Mal, my wife. He's watching what I described it. It's like the lights fading gradually in him. And watching those changes. My biggest fear is for my daughter. My biggest fear is her losing her dad. Experts who have studied the brains of these recently retired players say they're most likely suffering from something called chronic traumatic encephalopathy, or CTE, a condition that can occur when the brain suffers numerous small undetected traumas. It can result in memory loss, mood swings and ultimately dementia. Legal action is coming. A crossroads for rugby could follow. Chris McLaughlin, BBC News. Pupils across Scotland will not sit hires or advanced hires next year after the country's Education Secretary, John Swinney, announced the exams were being cancelled due to the pandemic. Our correspondent, Alexandra McKenzie, reports from Glasgow. So we get to a stage in maths where we've got to dispense with numbers. Pupils here should be looking forward to the Christmas holidays after months of disruption. They've already missed one year of exams. Now fifth and sixth years have just heard they won't be sitting their hires and advanced hires. It takes off a lot of stress considering people who have had to isolate. Uh, I've had to isolate and it's very difficult to catch up on the work that you've missed. I'm pleased and I'm also like terrified because um, I've not had the experience of sitting an exam. I just feel like I wouldn't be, I won't be getting the same kind of experience as past years. The Nat 5s had already been cancelled and there was pressure to also replace the hires with teacher assessment. This is safe, it is fair and it better recognises the reality of the disruption so many pupils have had to their learning in the course of the last few months. At this school in Glasgow, a quarter of its pupils, that's around 500, have had to self-isolate at least once. Some have been off several times. Yeah, absolutely. One senior absolutely. teacher at the school yeah, welcomed the decision but has some reservations. Is this assessment robust enough to stand up to um, possibly moderation because I suppose at the end of the day what we don't want to do is get children to sit assessments and then for it to come round and say sorry they don't stand up to scrutiny and you've inadvertently disadvantaged someone's potential future. It was also confirmed in the Scottish Parliament that all 11 councils under the toughest level 4 coronavirus restrictions will move down to level 3 from Friday so non-essential shops and hospitality can reopen. Alexandra McKenzie BBC News, Glasgow. Schools in England have been told they can shut and start the Christmas break early by scheduling an in-service training day for next Friday, the 18th of December. Ministers say they want staff to have six clear days before Christmas Eve so that teachers and heads do not have to assist with track and trace by identifying potential coronavirus cases throughout the festive break. 
The Queen and senior members of the royal family have met volunteers and key workers at Windsor Castle to thank them for their work this year. Windsor is the final stop on the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge's tour of Britain to pay tribute to individuals and organisations that have helped others during the pandemic. Our royal correspondent Nicholas Witchell's report contains flash photography. It is the season to say thank you, most particularly if you're a member of the royal family, charged with expressing the nation's gratitude to all those who've made the difference in this most difficult year. And so on the quadrangle of Windsor Castle, the Queen was joined by members of her family for some festive cheer, seasonal music from the Salvation Army and gratitude widely sprinkled to people who've done so much during the pandemic. The Cambridges, William and Kate, were there. They've spent the past 48 hours on the Royal Train, meeting key workers in different parts of Great Britain. A simple enough idea, you might think, except that England, Scotland and Wales all have slightly different Covid-related restrictions. And as the Royal Train made its way to Edinburgh and later to Cardiff, it became clear that some Scottish and Welsh leaders hadn't entirely bought into the idea of a visit by William and Kate. <laughs> Shortly before they arrived at Cardiff Castle this morning, the Welsh Health Minister said he'd prefer if there weren't, as he put it, unnecessary visits. He thought people might find it confusing. The Prime Minister later said the Cambridges tour had been a welcome boost to morale. And that, the raising of morale, is what this is all about. On the day when hope seemed a little more tangible with the start of mass vaccinations, the royal family came together to say thank you. Nicholas Witchell, BBC News, at Windsor. And finally, the MOBO Awards, the UK's biggest celebration of black music and culture, take place tomorrow, online of course, because of the pandemic. The awards for music of black origin started nearly a quarter of a century ago, but this year has proved more challenging for artists than ever before, as Colleen Harris explains. A warning, her report does contain flashing images. It's been going for nearly 25 years, celebrating some of the biggest names in music of black origin. Unlike previous years, tomorrow's event is a pre-filmed virtual ceremony. Thank you from the bottom of my heart again. Thank you to everyone that voted for me, to all my brothers that support me. There's no live audience, but they're trying new technology to bring an immersive experience. This is a year like no other, so we're producing a show like no other. And so for us, it was about using the power of black culture to bring people together. Its return after a two-year hiatus follows a year of highly charged Black Lives Matter protests, a movement that prompted the MOBO founder to pen an open letter to the culture secretary. We've seen a solidarity which is so powerful and impactful. So I would say to any creative, you know, look to see how you can kind of connect, how you can work together, how you can, fi can find that support system. 20 years ago, I was here in a different capacity. I was lucky enough to win one of these, so I know firsthand how much it means to an up and coming artist. But so much has changed in the music industry, especially in a year when it needs the support now more than ever. Colleen Harris, BBC News. Time now for a look at the weather with Darren Bett. Thank you very much indeed, Sophie. There wasn't as much fog around today across England, but it is beginning to thicken up in places this evening. Further north, it was a good day to have a big umbrella handy as the rain came tumbling down. It's been a wet day across North Wales and the northwest of England. That heavier rain moving down into the Midlands now, followed by some showers. Ahead of that wet weather, though, we've got the temperatures tumbling with a frost developing across parts of East Anglia and the southeast of England and that patchy, dense fog too. But that will tend to get washed away later in the night as that wetter weather moves down and the rain could still be quite heavy. Showers continuing further north. But some clearer skies developing in Northern Ireland, Wales and the southwest. The odd pocket of frost here. But generally speaking, it should be frost free by the morning. But we've got some wetter weather to clear away from East Anglia in the southeast first thing. And then skies will brighten in many areas. We'll have a few showers, although they are diminishing. And through the afternoon, the cloud will thicken in Northern Ireland, West Wales and the southwest of England with some rain coming in from the west. Ahead of that, light winds, still quite cold air, temperatures of six or seven degrees. The wetter weather that's coming in from the west isn't going to reach eastern areas, mind you, because that weather front is 
breaking up and most of the rain will be heading its way down into France. So the weather front breaks into two essentially. We've got some rain to clear away from southern areas moving southwards. Patchy rain continues in western Scotland, maybe giving some wintriness over the highlands. Further east there may be some uh, pockets of light rain or drizzle, but even if it does brighten up it's going to be quite cold in eastern Scotland and the northeast of England. Further west temperatures beginning to rise ahead of another band of rain pushing into Northern Ireland by the end of the day. That'll be accompanied by some stronger winds overnight. That weather front stuck across the UK on Friday. So on Friday it's going to be another cloudy day with some pockets of mainly light rain or drizzle. Sophie. Darren, thank you. A reminder now of our main story this evening. A world first as 90-year-old Margaret Keenan is the first person to receive the Pfizer COVID vaccine as the biggest vaccination programme in NHS history gets underway. That's all from the BBC News at 6. It's goodbye from me on BBC One. We join the BBC's news teams where you are. Goodbye.